Hi, thanks for coming. Great to see so many of you here tonight. We're really fortunate to have Christian Nunes as our speaker. Um, Christian is uh, a wildlife ecologist with a specialist on birds. He started with City of Boulder Open Space and Mountain Parks in 2007. And uh, he, he got his uh, master's degree at CSU. His interest in birds started very young. When he was three years old, he found a nest and brought it home to his dad. I'm trying to embarrass him. He brought, brought a nest home. His father was fortunately had natural history books and was able to foster that interest. It was a yellow warbler. And he went on to connect, uh, collect nests. Here he is as an eight-year-old. I think all dressed up around that with his nest collection. By age 12, he was working in a bird store and it goes on from there. He's worked in Venezuela and many other places. Um, today, he's uh, going to talk to us about um, trail camera use on City of Boulder open space. And I will turn it over to you. Hey, thanks so much, everyone. Happy to be here. Uh, a lot of friendly faces and some new folks. Um, again, I'm Christian Nunes, wildlife ecologist for the city of Boulder. And I'm just going to wait for the presentation to appear. There we go. And my talk tonight is about uh, remote cameras and the insights that we gain from using this technology on Boulder's wildlife. Michael, uh, can you remember to share the? Here we go. All right. Can everybody hear me okay? Great. And hold on first. Does anybody know what species that is? Sp spider bear. Yeah. <laughs> so um, I'm going to also start off with this is uh, nature doing natural things. Some of it's going to be kind of morbid and disturbing and a little gross. Um, so just be, if you have small children, you know, maybe, you know, Put them into bed. It's a little late, um, but it's all really interesting and biologically fascinating. Uh, so the city of Boulder owns about, uh, we own and manage about 45,000 acres of open space around the city of Boulder. Um, as the city of Boulder, we're separate from the county. We're different agencies, but uh, very similar missions. Uh, and our mission is really to protect natural lands and their functions uh, for the enjoyment of people, as well as the uh, persistence of healthy ecosystems. Um, we have 155 miles of trails that many of us enjoy. Um, and um, and yeah, it's just a great place and it's thriving. And the taxpayers of Boulder really are why this land exists. Um, starting in the 1960s, we set aside sales tax to purchase these open spaces. And that's why we have an almost contiguous ring of open space around the city of Boulder. Um, I really have to start off by thanking all of the wildlife staff at the city of Boulder. Um, what I'm going to present tonight is really a, a team effort, um, especially our technicians who are out in the field, um, kind of checking cameras, setting cameras, bringing the data back into the office uh, to upload into a database. And there's just a ton of data management that goes along with this really fun stuff. Uh, so Christina Fairbanks and Michael Yarbrough, especially for years, they've been out there doing this work. Um, uh, we have uh, Will Keeley and Heather Swanson um, are our supervisors, and they support our work and make sure that we have a budget to purchase cameras, things like that. Um, Ryan Priyreshi, uh, Tori Poulton, and Lauren uh, Beabout are also helping out. Hmm. There we go. Okay, sorry. I, click, I have to point and click in the right place. Uh, so what is a remote camera? Uh, it's not you know, a digital camera that you're out shooting animals with. Uh, it's really just something that you can put in place in situ and turn on and let sit there for as long as the batteries will last or as long as the memory card uh, will have memory to fill up with data. Uh, we even have solar arrays. You can plug these into a solar panel and just have them run, run, run. Um, so for, in theory, for years at a time, um, they have motion and heat sensing uh, capabilities. So when an animal crosses the beam, it triggers and takes a photo. Uh, you can set them to take videos. You can do a time lapse. Um, a lot of these modern cameras really have a ton of programmability. And so you can do all sorts of fun things. Um, we started using 
remote cameras in about 2008. Then we purchased the cheapest ones we could find, you know, maybe $100. And you kind of get what you pay for. So you had pretty low um, photo quality, um, but you still can tell, okay, that's a deer, that's a fox. Um, so there, and we started to do some research on the use of underpasses by wildlife. Um, so for instance, where Coal Creek goes under Highway 93, south of town, um, you know, we see a lot of mortality of deer, elk, coyotes, other wildlife getting hit on the highway. And so we're curious if that underpass would be a thoroughfare for wildlife. Um, so we started buying cameras to look at this. Um, and over the years, we got great results. So we kept purchasing cameras. And now we use what's called uh, the brand is Reconyx and they're the professional level cameras. They are developed for wildlife researchers. They're used throughout the world for a variety of applications. Um, and they really just have a great programmability. So you can set them to do whatever you need to if you're a researcher. Um, but they come at a cost, but it's totally worth it, you'll see. Um, and then one, one thing to highlight is that uh, we specifically choose cameras that have an infrared flash. Um, you know, some you can buy, you can go to Cabela's and buy yourself a hunting camera, but they're gonna have a, a white flash at what you're used to on a camera, but that's gonna A, disturb the wildlife that is taking a picture of, and B, people will see that if they're out on the system and if it's taking pictures of people. So we want we try to avoid people detecting our cameras. Uh, in the photo here, you can see one. It's on what we call a little buddy. It's just a little uh, maybe four by four post. Um, it's in a bear box. It's a steel box that's locked with a master lock. And then there's a cable lock through that and I'll chain it to a tree. So I try to do is, <laughs> and then it's that, that post is pounded into the ground with rebar. So I try to do as much as I can to prevent these from walking off. Um, and luckily none have, uh, which is I think amazing. Um, I also do put a label on there with my name and phone number in case somebody finds it, um, because we did have one, uh, basically a bomb was called in because somebody thought my camera was some sort of contraption. Um, so that the Rangers were not so thrilled, um, but since then I have great labels. Um, uh, I would like to start with some cute baby animals, of course, because who doesn't love a baby elk there? Uh, let's see if I can get this, see. So I'll be showing photos and videos tonight, and the trick with these is hoping that the video will work.
All right, easiest presentation I've ever had to do. Yeah, so we had uh, you know, folks here. I, I'm, so, I'm sorry, I don't have access to the Zoom, but uh, so we have gray foxes and white-tailed deer, bobcats, beaver, mallards, turkeys, that never-ending clutch that kept pulse walking by. Um, and we have these cameras there. They're throughout the system. And um, one point I'd like to make is try to keep the locations a little confidential. You know, so I've actually cut out kind of where they are. Um, so I hope you guys are okay with that. Um, so it, what do we do with these cameras? What do we use them for? Um, it's not just getting cool pictures and videos of stuff, although that's really the highlight. Um, but we use it to inventory and monitor wildlife on our open spaces. Uh, for instance, if we purchase a new property, we'd like to get a baseline inventory of what is out there. Um, and so we'll put out cameras, which are monitoring for 24-7. Um, and it's a lot more time efficient uh, than having biologists go out there. Um, we can use these to detect elusive creatures that are nocturnal, they're cryptic, just they stay away from people. Um, and sorry, I'm trying to read my notes here. Uh, and let's see what else. We use them to look at uh, travel corridors like the highway underpasses, see where animals are actually uh, moving through the landscape. And then we can make decisions on avoiding those areas with trail development or maybe improving those corridors so the animals have an easier way. You know, we're talk talking about creating overpasses or underpasses on our highways around Boulder, um, which is you know, these long-term goals of maybe having an overpass for elk on Highway 36 north of town. Uh, so we'll have this long-term data set to look back on. Uh, we use them as uh, to investigate presence and absence. So in prairie dog colonies, if we need to know if that prairie dog is still there, and if that, you know, if the burrow is active or not, we can use a camera. Um, as you saw the beavers, you know, we'll see if, if the beaver lodge or the beaver dam is active. We can put out a camera um, because the beavers, of course, are mostly out at night. And it isn't always easy, easy to tell how many there are, uh, how, how many there are and if they're there at all. And we also support research on our properties. So we have a funded and unfunded research programs. Um, so. Researchers have used these cameras, uh, their own cameras really, put on our system to investigate things like uh, wildlife use of trails or the proportion of color morphs, different color morphs of abert squirrels in Chautauqua to compare to um, the color morph proportions that were reported in the 1970s to see if that's changed. And you know, over the years, uh, we've had some really nice surprise discoveries. Um, most famous of which is this Northern River Otter, uh, which even has its own Facebook page. Um, I think it's the Facebook page is uh, I Love Fish Sticks. Um, so if you look that up. Um, so this was a camera that was on a beaver lodge that was along Boulder Creek uh, in a habitat conservation area east of town. And so in 2013, um, this is prior to the flood, by the way, um, we captured the otter. Uh, at least two, it had two visits um, and it really hammed it up in front of the, the camera here. It caught this, uh, what I think, I believe is a long-nosed uh, sucker, long-nosed sucker, yeah. Uh, and so munched on that fish in front of the camera. Um, unfortunately, this is in an era where the cameras didn't have video. So I, don't, I only have the still photos, but it's still pretty cool. Um, a ring tail, uh, folks know these as ring tail cats sometimes, um, very secretive, low density mammal that we do have in, in the Boulder area. We see them in the flat irons occasionally. And if folks read in the newspaper yesterday, one was captured in Longmont in somebody's house. Um, so they kind of got into their pantry and that's quite strange, but they're one of these species that we know very little about. We're on the Northern end of their range. They're more common in places like Arizona. Uh, but they do live in the front range. And so we see them um, in places like Mallory Cave. We've seen them hunting bats at Mallory Cave before. Um, and this one was just out in the woods in North Boulder, scampering through. Let's see, this, I apologize, this might be hard to see. Let's see, so these are Western spotted skunks. Uh, I'll use my pointer here for the audience, but there's one there. So they have a much different pattern of white on the black. And then this one is down here in the corner uh, and they have a bit of a different tail pattern than our more common striped skunk. 
And if you look closely, you can also see the marbling, the white marbling on that one. That was in Gregory Canyon. Oops. And a real highlight was we now find almost regularly American badgers on our properties and, and prairie dog colonies. Uh, this is a species that some of the older biologists in the department who are now retired remembered seeing them in the 1980s. And then they've been completely absent until the last uh, maybe five to seven years. So in 2018, um, some volunteers doing a seed collection on our system actually saw a family of badgers, took some cell phone photos and sent it around. And then I put out, I went and found a good looking burrow and uh, put the camera up and here it is. So over the years, since 2008, we've deployed 117 cameras. That, that's deployments, so 117 deployments. So it might be the same camera that I move around. Uh, we, own, we actually only own uh, seven or eight of them, but we move them around. And they've now, in the database, uh, there are over 98,000 photos of animals. Each of those photos is labeled. It's tagged with the species, the number of if there's multiple individuals, and sometimes even important things like we can say, oh, that's the silver morph of the Abert squirrel or the, the black morph. So we can kind of then query that database to say how many silver morphs do we see compared to the black morphs. Um, we can say things like, oh, that mountain lion has a collar because there's a big mountain lion study. So we can say that was a collared lion and any anything else you can imagine. Um, and this is really thanks to Colorado Parks and Wildlife and their photo uh, warehouse is what they call it. And so this is a free software, a free uh, access database that they provide to anyone. And so you can use this to organize your photos. Um, and so then from this, we can do outputs. So we can do data exports to say, you know, how many bears have we seen and when and where and what, were, you know, you can do ask many different questions. Uh, so having 94,000 photos is a lot of data points. Uh, we have detected 134 different species of animal. Uh, that ranges from, uh, you can see there's a cabbage white butterfly there in the top middle. So we have, you know, we get dragonflies, spiders, uh, all the little things, uh, small mammals. That's a, down the lower left corner, that's a hispid pocket mouse, which the only person here has heard of that is maybe Karen. You know, I guess, anyway, Scott Seaver's down here, but um, you know, these cryptic little mice that most people don't know about, but if you have the camera pointing in the right direction, the cameras pick them up. Um, snapping turtles, a uh, great horned owl eating a mouse, a moose, and even domestic cats, uh, which actually cats, uh, including bobcats, love to use those highway underpasses. That was a good finding that we have. Uh, mo basically, the most common animal using an underpass is going to be a bobcat. Um, and house cats. <laughs> we can look at things like activity patterns. So this might be hard to see, but essentially this is on the x-axis. It's the 24 hours of a clock. So on the left, it's going to be morning. On the right, it's going to be at night. And in the middle is the daytime. And the green, the tallest peak there, um, and the purple, the second tallest, that, that's people and dogs. So you can see that morning dog walk uh, peak and then the afternoon dog walk after work. And really the animals are on the, the tail ends. They're, they're out and about at night when there aren't as many people. And this is at one location for, you know, I, I can't remember how many years of data, um, but that's really, this is just a really small snapshot of one camera location. Um, but you can see how bobcats, coyotes, deer, um, foxes, all sorts of other animals are really out and about at night. Um, not, not completely. Um, and if you're in an area away from people, um, you, you'll probably see a, a more regular pattern of a more consistent use. And this kind of agrees with a lot of um, recreational ecology work that's been done in the West, um, showing that when there's a lot of human use in an area, the wildlife, especially things like predators, they tend to go nocturnal. And if you take the people out of the system, bobcats and coyotes become more diurnal. 
Uh, one question we've asked is, okay, um, many people, especially in the fall, wonder, when are the bears going to go to sleep? <laughs> or when are they? When can I put my bird feeder out? When are they going to come back out? Um, and so with our cameras, kind of the earliest we've seen bears emerge is in March 21st, which is, to me, you know, earlier than I would have expected. Uh, and then the latest we've seen them is December 15th. Um, and I had a note on here to just remind people that I'm positive that's a bear. I know it doesn't look like much. Um, in December, it looks like just the rump of a bear, but it did have an associated video, so I could watch the video. Uh, so, you know, there's a good spread of activity for the bears, and they're out in different seasons when we might, might not expect them. We've used the cameras to monitor rare and threatened species. So this is a Prebles Meadow jumping mouse, which is a federally threatened species. Uh, that persists in the Boulder area. And normally we study these by hiring uh, consultants and going out and doing trapping. And that takes a huge amount of manpower, person power. Um, we're out there setting live traps. You have to set them in the evening, bait them, check them at dawn, uh, make sure that you process the animal and release it. Um, we developed these, what we call the bucket traps. Um, a few years ago, off some research done in Florida, uh, looking at a different mouse. And so it's a just a five-gallon bucket from McGuckins. You bolt the camera on the inside of the lid, looking down, a little bit of bait, a couple of mouse holes on either side. Uh, and it turns out, and this is all kind of conceptual, we're like, oh, let's see, you know, put them out. Um, and so we did actually detect, I put it in an area I knew Preble's metal jumping mouse existed. We had trapped them. And lo and behold, there they are. So they come in and feed on the grain, um, as do voles and other types, more common species of mice like deer mice. Uh, but it's a nice non-invasive way. There's no, we do worry when we do live trapping of mortality. You know, there things can happen where a mouse is stressed, thing accidents happen. So this is a way to non-invasively document presence of the prebles. Hey, Christian, what, what tells you that's a preble? So they have an... A, a really beautifully long tail. So as you can see, I have a centimeter tape. Um, that doesn't work. Uh, so this the tail is longer than the body, um, much longer than the body. So uh, you know, one and a half times the length of the body. Um, this is I have multiple photos, and in other photos you can see it's very large feet. Um, they're almost like a little mini kangaroo. So they have big old feet, a really long tail. Um, and they also have a distinct pattern of darker brown down their back and lighter sides, which again, this doesn't show up well in this photo, but in other photos, you can really see that contrast. Um, and so they are, and they're tiny. So when you look at a deer mouse in this same frame, it would be almost twice as big. Um, and so this is a very small little mouse. They're adorable. They have those big kangaroo feet and that super long tail. And they are just amazing, capable jumpers. Um, I think they can jump something like eight feet in a bound. Um, and they live in riparian areas and they're actually good at, they're adept at, you know, jumping over the ditch. They have to get from one side to the other. They're very good swimmers as well. Um, so really, really great little mouse uh, that we're lucky to have here. Um, and I would say that we've also used those bucket traps in areas that we maybe suspect maybe they're there, but we we'd never find them. And so since it is a federally threatened species, they've done a lot of federal work to look at maps and say, where's the good habitat? And so around here, Boulder Creek is considered not, considered not occupied. Um, and so we have put the bucket traps along Boulder Creek and nice, hab nice looking habitat to see if they're there. Haven't found them, which would you know support what the federal um, maps depict. Um, this next story is definitely the graphic one. Um, so again, if you were discretion advised, this is morbid. Um, we had some cameras and we put it out on Prairie Dog Colony um, and we captured a, what I think, I know I'm a biologist, this is so fascinating. We captured this plague event. And as many people know, plague is, it's the you know bubonic plague, um, but it's, it is Yersinia pestis, it's a bacterium, it's uh, now, it exists in the area and it does go through small mammal populations and it tends to wipe out those populations or to a certain extent, um, often 95% or more. Uh, and we tend to notice it in prairie dogs because they're a very obvious uh, species. We see them on the ground and you hear them, you see them, and then maybe on your walk, you might notice, oh, 
they're roughly quiet all of a sudden. Um, and so we do see plague events come through. And we were able to detect this uh, back in 2013. Um, so this is in April. And this is the first sign of a problem. This is a female prairie dog, a uh, black-tailed prairie dog, and she is carrying her deceased up out of the burrow, um, which is like, oh, that's strange. Hmm. Um, there's actually evidence, they've done research that shows that prairie dogs participate in infanticide occasionally. Um, so at first when I saw this, I thought, oh, maybe this is infanticide. I've read about that. Very interesting. Uh, but then I kept watching and looking at the photos. Um, this is a adult male in the middle. He's kind of big and scruffy and scar face. He's, he's been in some fights and his two female mates, uh, which is normal. And they're together in the burrow. Um, then let's see. So that, that was on the 12th of April, which isn't showing up on your screen, but I can see it back there. Um, all of a sudden the female over there on the left, she's uh, kind of sitting on her haunches. She was looking a little weird. And this is not that strange to see them sitting. You'll see a prairie dog do that. Uh, but then we have the video. This is afternoon of the 13th. There we go. You've all been sick, I imagine. You know, and your partner comes up to you and says, hey, honey, how you doing? You say, ah, leave me alone. Get out of my face. So she was not having any of this canoodling. So she was very lethargic, acting a little strange. You can also see flies flying around the burrow entrance, which is not that strange at a prairie dog colony, but all the pieces kind of fit together that, oh, something's going on. Um, that was, I think, the last time, the 13th was the last time we saw the females above ground. They just disappeared. Um, so the next day, the 14th, the male started showing signs of being lethargic and acting strangely. Again, I know this is the male. He's got all these scars on his face. So here he is, just not looking so hot. Yeah, so I think the 12th was the pup. Um, 13th, 14th, you know, the females were starting to look a little sick. And by the 15th, he was clearly ill. Um, and then if you spend enough time with prairie dogs, uh, you know that they're actually very diurnal compared to a lot of other mammals in the area. They're just strictly out during the day. Um, he and I had this camera out for weeks, so I could kind of get that daily activity pattern. Uh, so this is the last photo we got of him during the day, and it was on the afternoon. I think it was about four or five in the afternoon. Yeah, I think it was four. Uh, and he went to bed at four in the afternoon, which, and it was April, so, you know, it's light out till 637. So that was a little strange. And the strangest thing is at eight o'clock that night, he came out of the burrow in the dark of night. And very sadly crawled away. That is what we would expect. Um, and so this that's this is the only instance I know of of a prairie dog emerging from a burrow, um, presumably with plague. You know, we're assuming it's plague. We didn't go and test them, uh, but that's most likely what it was. Um, and so you see that strange behavior, which you're not going to read about that anywhere. So these cameras are giving this insight of like, oh, what the heck? This animal just crawled out of its burrow in the middle of the night. Uh, this is the next that following morning. There's a little snowstorm, and Coyote spent you know, many hours digging at the burrow. Um, and did that change for our group on Coyote? Um, it so t basically no. Um, coyotes and and um, canids in general, um, they think are carriers, so they certainly have antigens and antibodies in their blood. Um, so they certainly contract it, but they don't get sick from plague. Cats, on the other hand, are highly susceptible. And so cats, especially even your house cat, um, will get sick and, and without treatment will die. Um, 
And that's actually the most common way that humans get plague is from their house cat that's outside. So they get in contact with the wild animal, they get sick, the, you're caring for your sick cat, you contract it as well. Um, humans though, I should stress, if it is properly diagnosed, is easily treatable. Um, uh, but yeah, the, the, the big mystery with plague is how does it move around the landscape? Uh, how does it get from, because it does, you see it go through in waves and it'll go through an entire region um, and just cl clear out all the prairie dogs in a huge area. Um, and is that the prairie dogs moving it between prairie dogs? Is the coyote transferring it? Um, there's a mouse called the grasshopper mouse, which is a highly predatory mouse. And they've suspected that maybe that's the vector, but nobody really knows for sure. Okay, more back to non- morbid stuff. Um, so, you know, you you have this camera out there all the time and then you get these fascinating interactions of different species. You don't really expect to be hanging out together. Uh, nice grainy photo of a striped skunk or a more common skunk and some mule deer. Uh, this is a great horned owl. And I don't expect anybody to be able to tell exactly what that other species is that it's eating, but I will tell you it's a short eared owl, uh, which is a very rare species in our grasslands. Um, and unfortunately, it, I presume the great horned owl predated the short-eared owl and ate it right in front of the camera. And when I checked the camera, I found the remains and could identify it by the wing. And we know that great horned owls are other owl predators. They are known to take out other smaller owls. And so this is a nice firsthand account of that. Okay, here's a nice video. So. Taking bets. Yellow bellied marmot. Local birds are not pleased. Tell there that mountain lion was just marking of its scent.
So everybody had to, you know, the, the world of the animals is not just sight and sound. It's really, they have the whole entire world of scent that they're keyed in on and they know their neighbors. They know that lion's been there. Uh, they're all looking around and a little bit, a little bit scared. Yeah, you have a question? This is a family group. So yeah, there's a gray foxes, so are kind of smaller, uh, less common uh, than our red foxes. Um, but this is a family group and uh, we'll see a little bit more of them. But they were hanging out in this spot quite a bit. No, that is just, that was actually put in well after I put the camera there. So um, it's in a trail alignment. I have no idea what the stick is. It has some numbers and things on it, but not for me. Yeah. The, the time between when the mountain lion was there versus when the coyotes, I'm just curious. Yeah, it was about a week. Um, well, the coyotes were there the next day. And the deer, like the, this is all in, actually in, in chronological order. Um, I should have like had that uh, in mind, but, um, and there were other animals too. Like I just picked the best videos of them interacting. So the coyotes are there a lot. Um, but you could tell that these animals are clearly still interested in that spot at least a week, if not more later. Um, uh, but then of course, everything else is marking the same spot. So, the, um, but you see this a lot. Um, the animals will mark certain spots and they'll come back, you know, other species will come by, mark it, and continue on. Um, I, what I don't have in this presentation, but I do have, um, documentation of a mountain lion going by the camera. Um, and within... 10 minutes, a deer followed it. It went, the deer in the same direction, following it behind. And, you know, you're just like, what are you, what are you doing, deer? Yeah. Do you, kind of, do you not smell that mountain lion? So um, it's pretty interesting how these animals, and you could tell that also that mule deer that got scared by that turkey that jumped out of the tree and spooked it. Um, you know, that I think that deer was oblivious that that bird was there and it just thought, oh no, was that a lion? It heard the, um, I they, there are time stamps. I uh, took them all off. I basically cropped them out. Um, there's other data associated with it in, in the same bar. Um, and just to kind of keep confidentiality of locations and things, I took those off. And actually, these screens that you see up here um, are cutting off the bottom because um, I can see a screen behind you that I've been seeing some information that you can't see on here. So some of them do have a timestamp and I'm like, oh, that's why I could tell the dates of those prairie dogs because I could see it. And here's a little montage about animals eating things. Yep, plums. Plums, yep.
it's the coy the coyote. Yeah. It's these are that was, you know, I think the magpie must have been watching the coyote. Uh <laughs> jumped right right down. Caprophagia. Uh that's the technical term. Um <laughs> How am I doing on time? People in charge. I have no idea what time it is. Good? Yeah. It's eight o'clock. Okay. This is going to be 10 minutes long. Is that okay? Perfect. All right. All right. Here we go. This is the finale. Yeah. Sure. I wasn't sure if that was appropriate. Uh, yep. Yep. Yeah. So this is... um. Absolutely, I'd be happy to. I wasn't sure what would be appropriate. Here, I'll kind of go back. Yeah, let me start. So this is a red fox. Fluffy tail with a white tip. And I put the cameras in places like this where you can see that boulder is lifting up the fence. So animals, it's a natural corridor where they can get under the fence. So that was a good spot to put a camera. Yes, that burrow there, yep. This is all the same badger. Um, it is no longer there. It was there for that spring. And then it's a male, um, as we'll see soon. Um, foreshadowing. <laughs> This animal spent an inordinate amount of time scratching. I, I think it must have just been really heavily loaded with fleas, unfortunately. That's right. Yeah, this is a beaver chewing station. Um, I actually set this camera about two weeks ago, and that was just last week. No, that, that was just, they were just interacting. Um, I think it's a dominance type display. They were completely silent. I first saw it, I thought, oh, this is going to be so cool with the sound. But... Sticks. Yeah, I know. Sticks and blades of grass are a constant problem, but. They're doing very well in the Boulder area. Um, Many of these kind of medium-sized predators, I think, are doing very well um, because of our thriving prairie dog populations, uh, squirrels, rabbits. Um, so yet they're surprisingly common on the cameras, and you'll see them around neighborhoods. Yeah. 
just missed. Bobcat P destroys those metal cases. It takes the it takes the paint right off. This is the gray fox again. Just a great shot. Teat little things. Gray foxes are known as being able to climb trees, um, unlike other canids. an elk. These are long-eared owls, which are known to roost communally like this. And the one on the left is the one making the noise, if you listen carefully, it chitters. And it's agitated by the one on the, the ground here. He's like, no, you're getting too close to me. And if you look closely, right there at the top right is a third owl, its wings and tail. That's right, yeah. Hey, it, um, they, this is, it was a surprise to me that they are roosting on the ground here um, in this single horizontal tree branch. And uh, they normally are roosting a little higher up in conifer trees, but it's such a dense tangle there. I found the, the whitewash, they poop during, you know, during their, their roost. I found that and set up a camera thinking, oh, it's a great horned owl, maybe. It turns out they're long ears. <coughs> Same spot. Probably looking for owl poop. <coughs> So called jump yip, just the all clear signal prairie dogs give. That's the same burrow that the badger was living in, so that was a very brave prairie dog. And these are muskrats, so they were coexisting with the beavers. Um, this is a whole family, I think. Nine, ten, eleven. I don't know. I suspect they might build their own lodge adjacent um, or nearby, but they spend a lot of time on the lodge eating, hanging out. There's a story that goes that in the maybe 1970s, uh, there was a mink farm on Arapaho, and they released their animals at some point when they went bankrupt. And so a lot of our mink in Boulder have white. They're strangely colored. They're, you know, they have white feet or white chins. And they're big. And I, I kind of wonder if they're maybe the ancestors of those released mink.
Would be. Uh, so I was just asked to, if we've captured any grouse. Um, we have dusky grouse, and the answer is no. It's like my one. I need to go target grouse because <laughs> they do displays uh, in the, the spring, so you can find their display spot and set up a camera on my list. Of them. Yeah. White spots uh, they often so that the question is what are the white spots on the bear's fur um it, they're burrs um hound's tongue uh the poor things i mean there's so many different uh, seeds that they get matted down with uh, the, and that was in the fall so kind of late summer fall and that is that thank you all thanks for watching <laughs> I'd love to take some questions and folks on Zoom have questions and my email's on the bottom here. So, oh, there we go, hello. So we'll take some questions and we'll go back and forth. Sandra, do you wanna say anything before we start? Just uh, asking folks in the room to use the mic. We can't hear the question if you don't use the mic. So it's important, Great. wait for the mic to come to you. Question and message into the mic with questions. Christian, do you have any cameras um, without telling locations set up to uh, where the Marshall fire went through? We do. Uh, yeah, we actually put cameras out um, as soon as possible right. to look at that regrowth. And and I considered adding them some footage in of that. I actually put out a time lapse um, up on Davidson Mesa, um, which shows I left it out for months. Um, and you can really just see how everything went from denuded to, you know, thriving green grass, waving prairie, um, to look at that recovery. Um, and I would say that the area is still full of life. Um, it is. Yeah, I'm particularly interested in the, there's a prairie dog colony on Marshall Road that's in the coal. You know, they, they yep. act the mound, which is yep. amazing to me. It must be nice and warm right now. <laughs> Sandra, question from the Zoom group. I'm, I'm going to bundle a couple of questions here um, but about your technology. One is which model of Reconyx do you use? And the other one uh, is about uh, if you use a, a camera with a white flash, does that deter the animals? Yeah, we chose to not use white flash from the get-go. Um, so I've actually never used one, but I, presuming that uh, it will at least disturb the animal, it will give them a little scare. Some of the infrared cameras still um, have a little red blinking that the animals clearly can um, detect. Uh, the reconics we use, I I don't think, they're, they're really made to not be detected by anybody. Um, so they don't have any, they're really quiet. Um, and the model is the Ultrafire XP9, which is no longer made. So we bought them a few years ago. That model is now discontinued, um, but they work great for us and they've been lasting years and years. And we use, typically we use lithium batteries, but and also rechargeables, um, but a pair of, you know, set of lithium batteries will last over three months. Mm -hmm. So we can put it out and leave it for many weeks or months at a time. And some of these, these cameras we put in sensitive areas. So we don't want to be going there every day, you know, every week. So we go many, you know, months or weeks um, between visits just to not disturb the, the wildlife. Another question from the room. There's your question. Mm -hmm. Wait a second. So how often have you detected river otters? Uh, just two times and maybe the same animal. Um, it was maybe a few weeks apart. Um, we have had other sightings in the area along Boulder Creek. Um, we've had many reports, but I don't always believe them. There's a lot of confusion with mink because uh, mink are also a, a generally aquatic uh, mustelid. So they are out swimming about and people if you don't know the size difference, can, they can be pretty difficult to tell apart. But I do believe they're out and about. Um, they're certainly more common in the St. Rain River. So Boulder County has a lot more uh, sightings on their properties than the St. Rain watershed. And presumably these animals, um, they were released by uh, Colorado Parks and Wildlife um, 
in, um, I think around Grand Lake and Rocky Mountain National Park in the 1970s. And so the population has been growing from that core uh, since then oh, and uh, now have crossed the divide and are coming down the watersheds. 72 or three when Wiley killed that one up there. Hmm. Sandra, yes. another question from the Zoom group? Yeah, a question from uh, Bill Schmoker. Uh, have you used trail cams with cell service? And what are your thoughts about those? Yeah, that's that's the modern development is you can get cameras that actually send you all the pictures in real time. You can get a notification on your phone, but that costs money and no. So. Another question from the room, here it is. Ask about the kit foxes. Well, we'll get to it, Nancy, hang on. Oh, okay. He said he has uh, seen, he's got two pictures of this officer. He also. So, great presentation. My question is with the book, Immense World, that came out, Ed Young, Young, um, he talks about how different animals have different senses. You know, their their sight is totally different than ours, their hearing and everything. So I'm curious if wildlife biologists know that the infrared lights you're using is really not impacting the animals. It probably is impacting some, but not to the extent as the, you know, visible. So you've seen two. Uh, and so um, I think that many of these mammals are, have about the same spectrum, uh, visual spectrum that we do. Um, but said, things like the insects, we know, see in the red range. Um, but these are typically going. Up in Grand Lake <laughs> and also Somebody's um, watershed. That explains where. Sandra, can you mute the Zoom folks? Somebody's talking. I'm, I'm trying. <laughs> um, but we don't have kit foxes. I hear them talking about kit foxes. Unfortunately, not in Boulder. Just gray foxes and red foxes. I'd um, like to add something. Um, sure, yeah, well, let me answer yeah. Teresa's question a little bit more fully, maybe. Uh, the answer is no, we don't, I mean, I don't know. Um, I would presume we're trying to use the technology that least is the least disturbing to the animals. Yeah. Um, Bushnell creates, a, we have a, one Bushnell camera that has an interchangeable flash, and one of them they call the black flash, which is apparently like, you know, super covert. All of these are branded for hunting um, originally. So, you know, covert, you know, like really, really yeah, don't disturb that big buck. Um, so, um, but it's clear looking at thousands and tens of thousands of photos that yes, the animals clearly know there's a camera. Um, but as the technology's improved over the years, these newer models are, um, I think, not as noticeable. Um, and as you've seen, like they're on that big post, Bobcats pee on them. They're sniffing, you know, we have a lot of videos of bears, coyotes, everything sniffing the camera, deer. Um, but back in the day, when I first, the first montage I made, I had fun little, like a deer kind of looking at it and like, you know, going, jumping back. But I don't see that anymore. I think that these new cameras are much less of a disturbance. I'd love to add an answer to Teresa's question, which is a perception issue, the um, wonderful sequence you had of the two coyotes. So the one coyote with the humped back, that's a real strong defensive posture. And then the other coyote scratched the ground. Well, they have um, uh, scent glands on their paws. And so that coyote was scent marking as a dominant animal. So, you know, just not visual exactly in the way you were asking, but uh, there's a lot going on that we don't always see or don't always understand. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. Um, back to you, Sandra. Steve, now, do you want to ask your question? Please unmute. Sure, I just wondered how many bears do you think live on OSMP properties? Oh, I have no idea. And that is the tricky thing with these, this technology is getting a population estimate on anything. Um, there are some rather sophisticated um, models you can do to try to get population estimates, but without really knowing which is which, um, it's hard to know if you're counting the same individual over and over again, or if they're different individuals. Um, but bears are very common. Um, 
I think the state does do annual population estimates. That's more based on their, um, you know, hunting quotas and things. They have to calculate that. Um, but I don't know off the top of my head, but we have a lot of bears. I have another question from the audience here. Um, over the years, I've seen the morph of the red fox that is black. Right. And I'm wondering if that's like the mink that I've heard that they were released. Yeah. Or if um, that's a natural morph of the red fox. Um, so that we call those the silver morph for some reason. Um, they kind of have a silvery bit of on their back, but they're, they're clearly black. Uh, really, really beautiful animals. And um, they're quite common, especially up in the foothills. Um, and Karen, maybe, I don't know if you know the answer to that, if that's a natural color morph that exists here in Boulder, or if it's something that's maybe influenced by fur yeah. grading. Uh, no, I do think it's a natural morph. There's also the cross phase where yeah. they kind of have a cross across their shoulders. Yeah. So uh, it's a little bit like hair color. They can be in the same uh, litter, but the black ones are not uncommon and they're often called silver phase, yeah. but not like the gray fox. So keep those in yeah. mind as different species. Sandra, back to you. We had a question about uh, airplane noise. We heard that in one of the videos with the bobcats. There were car noises and some of the others. Could you comment on how often you pick up sort of those kinds of sounds and what impact they have that you can see? Well, if anybody's been in Boulder, uh, yeah, that's a common scenario. Uh, finding quiet is very difficult. Um, and we don't use the camera, these cameras specifically to look at that, but we have done specific studies using um, really, you know, long-term audio recording uh, and analyze that uh, in certain areas and natural areas like the White Rocks um, to compare it. You know, and these are supposed to be pristine, almost untouched places. And clearly there's a lot of noise going on. And so we've partnered with um, places like CSU who have, um, they actually have like a sound lab. And so we'll send them the data and have the, them analyze it for us. And we have, um, I can get, if anybody has that specific question and wants more information, uh, my email, uh, you can email me and I'll get you that. Um, Nunes, N-U-N-E-S-C at bouldercolorado.gov. I have another question here in the audience. You're you're mentioning that uh, the department could use photos to investigate some questions that they have about management and the open space lands. Mm -hmm. And I'm wondering if anybody has been discussing or thought about using photo cameras to investigate the impact of off-leash dogs in some of these habitat areas. Um, and and the specific question I'm wondering about is the the footage of bears and others eating berries, um, whether in those berry laden gulches or draws, you've ever put cameras and seen off leash dogs come into the cameras. I would say that almost every camera location that we've had has had a dog or human or both. Um, not every single one, but it's a high proportion, even in areas where they shouldn't be. Um, and it's completely conceivable that you could design a study to look at those things. We have not. Um, there have been other studies on open space. Um, you know, Rick Knight studies, we were actually just discussing before the presentation, looking at the effects of on-leash, off-leash dogs and no dogs on wildlife. And we do use those studies in our management of you know, leash restrictions and grassland nest, bird nesting areas. Um, but it's certainly a field that's up and coming. Um, there are people throughout the West and throughout the country looking at effects of recreation, and that could be dogs, people, um, motorized vehicles, all sorts of things. Um, but we haven't used it specifically to look at that question. Um, and it would likely take uh, more resources than we currently have dedicated to the camera program, uh, which has been a bit piecemeal. Um, and kind of when we have a little bit of money in the budget, we can put it towards camera, but you'd need um, likely is uh, many times more cameras than we have. You know, you need 50 cameras maybe to look at things uh, to do it in a really rigorous way. Um, so it's certainly an idea, and it's something that we might propose for our funded research program. We 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 ask researchers to, hey, here are our 
kind of hit list of questions that we'd like you to look at. And so that might be an avenue where we say, please look at this question. Wait, wait, wait. Locations oh, yeah. where you have the cameras, are they generally near trails or are they generally far away in habitat conservation areas where there are no trails or can you give us? Yeah, so they, for me, I like to put them away from trails. I'm not interested in capturing people. Um, there are, the rangers use these cameras as well to, for law enforcement. So they they have them directly at trailheads. You've probably seen them as you come and go. Um, but for me, um, I'm not looking at what the humans are doing. We do have the human dimensions group and other folks who, who do look at that. Um, so I am typically focused on looking for those places. And, I, and I've kind of mentioned in my talk, you have that spot where the, the fence is going over the boulder. It's an ideal kind of corridor. You're going to see a game trail. And so what I'm doing is really targeting those places that, you know, the beaver chewing spot that might have some wildlife uh, versus if you were going to be doing research, you might want to randomize that uh, or put it in a grid of cameras. Um, so really, I have only a, couple, a handful of cameras and I do put them uh, strategically to get cool photos. <laughs> uh, so. Sandra? Uh, Carl had a question about uh, how far away was that badger from the camera? Is it, is it, is it as close as it looks? So yeah, it's not quite as close as it looks. They actually have a little bit of a zoom. Um, so we try to, that this, and each model is a little different. And so you have to kind of learn like what their, their range is. Um, so that camera wasn't quite as, you know, right up in front of it as it looked. Um, Cause those reconics are set to be kind of zoomed in just a little bit. It was, you know, two meters away. It's not like it's super far back, um, but it's actually a problem where I'm always actually moving the camera further back in many places. Um, and then you can actually work with these companies, Reconics, especially Bushnell, um, to actually uh, really make a camera and a lens for your specifications. Um, we have Nat here in the audience, which I know I think you've worked with folks to you know, uh, look, look at a uh, rock wren nests with cameras, right? So you had a special camera to, designed to look at close up. Wait, hold on. Yeah, Reconyx is really good about setting a custom focal length, they yeah. call it. Great. Yeah. Okay, I have another question here. Are there any species that have been absent from Boulder for decades or? Um, years that you're particularly excited to see again? Um, absolutely. The badger is a huge one and the otter. Um, unfortunately, the otter seems to be kind of like that was a one-off and there they were. Um, they're more common throughout the county, but um, on our system, really the badger, I'd say, is like the, the most exciting recent re-popular. Re, uh, yeah. So they've, they've come back naturally. They uh, we don't know why they kind of disappeared. Um, it was likely a combination of factors. Disease is probably a big factor. Plague is something that might also take out badgers as well as prairie dogs. Um, and now they're just, they've moved in naturally. They, they, nothing that we've done. We've supported prairie dog populations, but they have um, wandered in and they're now breeding and we're happy to see that. Um, in my dreams, I always hope that a pronghorn would walk by. Um, uh, Jackrabbits are a species that have disappeared, but we kind of hope that in one of those banner years, which I kind of heard this summer, maybe like the population was starting to show signs of a boom. Um, but, you know, that's a species that we would hope maybe would make it back. Um, and of course, a wolf. Christian, I have one to add. The porcupine. The porcupine. Disappeared. Right. Yeah. Porcupines have disappeared. And we have no idea why. Um, and I don't have any photos of porcupine with the cameras, but I think I told you, Karen, I had one in the culvert next to my apartment in North Boulder a couple of years ago. And, uh -huh. you know, my neighbors were looking at something in the tree and I, you know, I was like, oh, that's a, a bird, you know, what are you looking at? And it's a porcupine and spent the night in the culvert. So um, that's the only one I've seen in Boulder. Sandra? I have a question uh, for myself, which is, are there, could you give us an example of a management decision that might change because of this camera data? Like what would be some, I mean, it's super cool. It's super fun. What would be something that if you saw it on the camera might change what you do with open space? 
Uh, thanks for putting me on the spot. Um, I have an idea, Christian. I'll take a question here and you get a yeah, moment to no, I, I think I sort of have an answer. Um, you know, somebody looked, you, you saw that that post, right, with the mountain lion that marked its scent. Uh, that it's a trail alignment, that trail is being built. Um, but that was many years of negotiations among staff about where to put that trail because it's crossing a drainage with that riparian habitat, which we all know is very important for animal movement, it's food, it's, you know, there's th those plums or food for so many different animals. Um, but what we're trying to do is we're actually building a bridge across that. So instead of just moving people through that drainage and over that gully, we're going to put them over it. And so hopefully that will maintain a little bit of that connectivity uh, so animals can move up and down that drainage. Uh, but I would also point out that that trail is half a mile from a highway. Um, so it's, you know, we're just trying to reduce the fragmentation that we're creating. Um, and that's also in habitat conservation area. Um, so we're trying to limit the activity, the, the use of that area by recreationists to the trail and limit the areas off the trail so that the wildlife have space. So it's always a balance of that recreation and wildlife and all other uses of open space. I have another question here. This is just quick. Where do we see the gray foxes? Where yeah, so those are up in North Boulder. Um, I've only seen myself. I've seen one gray fox. Uh, we have many more photos on the cameras. Um, but you know, one place I'd recommend is um, El Dorado Mountain open space. As you walk up from, if you know that area by the Yoga Ashram on County Road 67, there's that, it's called Spring Brook, that draw, that gully. It's a nice rocky, shrubby habitat. I've seen gray fox there. Um, and then in uh, just the, the Dakota hogback realm, you know, generally that rocky, shrubby habitat. Yeah, we have them in Pinebrook Hills, and I know Ann Cooper had one in a tree at around fourth along Fourth Street. Great, yeah, yeah a, a yeah. while back, yeah. Ah, okay. Here's another question here. Have you th have you thought about reintroducing ferrets? Uh, that's Boulder County. I mean. That would be interesting with so many prairie dog towns. Right. So that uh, Paul is asking about reintroducing the black-footed ferret, which is the most endangered mammal in the world. Um, but they have, uh, you know, they a foothold in Colorado as now in their Arizona, New Mexico, Wyoming, Kansas now, I think. Um, and so there is there are efforts to reintroduce them um, to the region, but we can't do it ourselves. Um, we just don't have enough space. Um, we have a lot of prairie dogs, but a lot of our colonies in the urban area, they're fragmented. So they're not contiguous. Um, there are a lot of different predators, right? So we have a lot of great horned owls. We have a lot of coyotes and things that um, I think that the people in charge of that program, um, that endangered species, they don't look at our system and say, oh, that's perfect. They're looking for larger, large complexes that are in more remote areas where they're not going to get into trouble because it's uh, they only have so many ferrets to release. And so it's a very, very serious decision where you put them because you don't want to lose them. Um, but what we're doing is trying to uh, support our prairie dog populations. Uh, we put out sylvatic plague vaccine on part of our system where in theory, in the future, we might be able to reintroduce ferrets. So if we can keep the prairie dog stable, there will be a food source. Sandra, any more at your end? I don't see any. I think we've asked all of ours. Okay, I have another one here. I noticed I didn't see any ear tags or or necklaces on any of the animals. Do you get many pictures? Yeah, we we do. Um, so there's um, there was a lion study, um, which is now over ten years old, I think. Um, so in back in the you know 2010 to 13 era. Uh, we'd capture some mountain lions with collars. Um, it could have been the same lion I captured a few times. Um, and then we did a collar deer study just a few years ago. And I'd say we just we don't have many cameras in that study area. And those deer are rather sedentary. So they live around NCAR, um, kind of the Shanahan Ridge area. And that's also an area full of trails. And um, so I, I just don't put a lot of cameras out that way. Um, but those animals, they exist and bears too. We'll see bears with 
the blue ear tags that they get if they get in trouble. Um, so if you look through those uh, pictures, enough of them, you'll find those animals that are marked. We do, have another, we oh, do have another question. Yes, Nancy, okay, go, go ahead. ahead, Sandra. Nancy, unmute, and ask yours. Go ahead. Oops, you were unmuted. We're not hearing you, Nancy. <laughs> Elena, would you like to ask yours in the meantime? Yeah, I just had heard that there are sometimes coatis here, but I've never seen one. Have Has one ever turned up on a camera? Are you sure it's coati and not the ringtail? Ringtail. Yeah, yeah. Coati is more of a Mexican species. Yeah, I'm sorry. Oh, no worries. Uh, they're really cool. They're mm -hmm. are great. Um, but they're all closer. They're all in the raccoon family. So coatis, ringtails. Um, but, but the ringtail, yeah, they're still very rare. We have that one photo from the cameras and one modern site record from uh, the Flatirons. And then um, I've heard of a, maybe one or two seen in El Dorado Canyon State Park. They're rock climbers, you know, and they're adorable. So a rock climber, I was thrilled to see that. And then the one in Longmont yesterday. So, yeah. Right. I have another question here. Um, I was just curious if um, where you're doing these trail alignments and you decide, yes, you know, we are going to put a trail here and you said it's going to be a bridge. Are you going to afterwards, you know, have the cameras out for a while to see what's going on with those animals? Right. So, and that's the nice thing about the cameras. You get that before, after look at things. Um, and so, yeah, I, I would say, yes, we will keep that camera. Maybe not right there, because if it's visible from a trail, somebody's going to snag it. Um, but in the same general drainage up up or downstream um, to see if those animals persist, if they habituate. Anything in ecology is tricky because over time, there are so many variables that could affect populations. Um, it's hard to say that's why X is doing well or doing poorly. Um, but we can at least observe and see um, I suspect the coyotes and deer and things will be doing okay. Um, I didn't want to say like that there was that one mountain lion that marked and then the animals came and, and marked the same spot. I think maybe we've seen one or two lions there. Um, and if you look at the frequency of detections, lions are extremely rare, um, surprisingly so. I mean, everybody thinks, oh, boulder, they're mountain lions. They're just sitting on my neighbor's deck uh, talking to my neighbor's cat, you know? and um, I don't know if it's a figment of where we're putting the cameras, but we only have 96 photos out of 98,000 of lions, so not that many. Christian, do you ever use any scent marking stations or scent stations to draw critters to your cameras? Great question. I'm glad I was going to mention that. Uh, no, we do not. Um, these are all passive. Um, just put them out there in a cool spot and hope to see what we see. Um, but they they certainly are. There are lures you sent lures you can buy online and things like that. Uh, we've done things like you find a, a you know a carcass or something, you can put up a camera and see the cool scavengers. Uh, but it's all opportunistic. And yeah, we're trying not to lure things. Well, Christian, I want to thank you so much. This was a wonderful talk. I think everybody Thanks, really enjoyed it. Yeah. Thanks for coming. It's my pleasure. Thanks, Boulder Audubon and everyone for coming. We'll bid you good evening. Thanks for coming.